Welcome to another episode of the Profitable Accountant Podcast. I'm enrolled agent Jason Bowman, and I'm joined today by Dan Hen, CPA. Welcome, Dan, and welcome to those of you that are listening in. Really appreciate it. Uh, we are going to dive right in to some, some juicy goodness brought to us uh, this past week by the Treasury Inspector General for Tax Administration uh, with their August 11th report, report number 2021-30-042. Uh, and I will put a link down below in the show notes as well. Uh, this is regarding efforts to address the compliance risk of underreporting of S corporation officers' compensation are increasing, but more actions can be taken. So right before we started recording, Dan and I were, were talking about this, and this is something that's been an ongoing issue, a compliance issue for 20 plus years. Um, the, the, the courts have found repeatedly that the IRS has the authority to reclassify distributions uh, from an S-Corp uh, into wages, and then to make an assessment against the, the S-Corp for the unpaid payroll taxes. Uh, this is primarily an issue having to do with FICA um, and making sure that the Social Security and Medicare taxes are being paid. So what was really, really interesting to me about this report is that yet again, continuing problem, TIGTA found that approximately 50%, it was 49.5, almost half of all S corporations are paying zero reasonable compensation to their shareholder officers. And Dan, how much of this do you see in your practice with your clients? It, this is Jason, this is a, a very common occurrence. I mean, I, it, it, you know, when you sent this to me, I hadn't seen it yet. And uh, I mean, it doesn't surprise me that Tigda went and looked at it. I mean, obviously it'll surprise some people when we talk about the, the results, the recommendations, and what the IRS said about it. But, you know, in practice, this is unfortunately a very common thing. I mean, in some regards, people don't know. In some regards, that you know, people are using tax professionals that don't know any better, because um, I've seen both. Um, but it, it's a challenge, even for somebody like myself to, you know, to get people to do the reasonable compensation. Um, and it's And it's becoming a point where, um, I'm getting to the point where, you know, to work with me, this is what you got to do and, and, you know, setting them up right off, off the bat. Now, what, what is reasonable compensation for, you know, the practitioner? Um, obviously, it's different for everybody and there's services out there you can use to help determine that or, or formulas you can try to roughly calculate that. Um, but, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, companies that, that aren't out there. And I'm telling people, it's like, this is one of the easiest things that the IRS can see. There is a line that says distributions. There's a line that says right. officer's compensation. And when the officer's compensation is zero and distributions is a big number. And one of the things that I was looking at in the report is that, that TIGDA looked at is that they looked at the income as well. Uh, you know, what was the profit? How much was distributions? Um, you know, because if, if, if they're not taking distributions, it's not a problem. It's when they're taking distributions and they have profits, um, although technically profits aren't even a necess necessity because um, reasonable compensation is reasonable compensation, even if it creates a loss. Right. Um, I don't necessarily like and ascribe to that particular aspect sure. of it. But, um, you know, it, it's it's one of those things that easy it can easily be found. Um, and, and it's just, you know, I think as practitioners, we've got to take that hard line stance. And, and that's the thing I think a lot of people don't realize is you are the one who can control your practice, not your clients. Now, yes, we want to have people like us. We want to have clients, you know, we want to have people become clients of ours, but you control it from the get go. If you want to, you know, you tell them, you want to be my client, uh, you know, and it's easier when they're referred to you as opposed to somebody who just finds you off the street. But, you know, if, if you want to be my client, this is what you need to do. And this is how we're going to do it. Um, and that's, you know, we've we've got a mutual friend of ours. This is where I first learned kind of something like this, that 
he makes, uh, he's a CPA in California where he uh, makes his clients, if you want to be my client, we do your QuickBooks. Um, yes. and, you know, and, and I, I like that. Um, I don't want to do the bookkeeping, so I don't do that, but I like that particular aspect because if, obviously if you can control the bookkeeping and you've got the staff to handle that and manage that aspect of it, then you know that it should hopefully be done correctly Bingo. Um, and you can fix it and know it's going to be fixed forever in the future instead of having this, you know, fixing it through AJEs every year because they, they won't update their books. So, um, but, you know, this is another thing that I think pra practitioners, you know, even though we'll get into what the TIGDA recommended and what the IRS did or, or said they're going to do, in light of the uh, what's going on in Congress today to give more money to, to the IRS um, for, for enforcement, for more, for more inf specifically for enforcement, um, that I think in today's IRS, that's what they're saying in tomorrow's IRS. Now, I mean, em employees and staffing is a whole separate issue. Um, but, you know, if they get the people and they get them on board, and of course, this is something we're talking about probably two or three down years down the line, but, you know, they can easily pull up a report and find, you know, dozens of people um, in a particular, you know, zip code, probably even thousands of people in a, in a particular zip code that aren't meeting this criteria and quickly send them a notice. I mean, this is this is something you can do a, a correspondence audit just on that alone, correct? And and find a lot of hidden money, um, and cause a lot of new collections problems. Absolutely. Uh, let me share with you some some uh, quick stats here from from the report. Um, first of all, uh, this problem they're estimating is contributing uh, a little, uh, pretty close to about ten percent of the estimated tax gap. Um, so from that perspective, it may not sound like a huge problem, but I mean, $30 billion is $30 billion. Uh, you know, even in this era of, you know, trillion dollar um, uh, spending packages going through, through Congress without much of a, of a blink of an eye. Um, from this, it shows that 90%, 90% of S Corps have only one shareholder. Uh, so obviously it's the majority of the folks uh, out there. It is a very popular uh, 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 vehicle for running a business. Uh, what TIGTA found was that 371,000 S Corps had labor costs, but didn't issue W-2s. So there's a W-2 and W-3 compliance problem as well. Um, and I already mentioned half, half of these S Corps are not uh, issuing any officer's compensation whatsoever. So when, when, you, when you take a look at these numbers and just how, how prevalent the, the issue is, um, and, and then you also look at, you know, once you understand a little bit about the IRS computer systems, like you already said, it's dirt simple for the IRS to pull a report of exactly who to send the notice to. And the the uh, the the TICTA report does applaud the IRS for some of their past compliance initiative programs, um, you know, special compliance initiatives that they've done to try to address some of these things, and they acknowledge it has gotten better over the past decade. But the real issue that TICTA is calling out the IRS on about has to do with their examination workflow and the fact that revenue agents doing field exams and TCOs doing office audits, they are not required to basically raise the issue of reasonable compensation when they're doing an examination of an 1120S. Mm -hmm. um, they can, they're allowed to obviously, but more often than not, they don't. So one of the recommendations that TIGTA made, uh, they made five recommendations out of this report and one of them was to change, you know, make some changes to the examination workflow to call out these reasonable compensation issues. The IRS declined to agree with that recommendation. Out of the five recommendations, the IRS only agreed with two of them. And the two that they agreed with only had to do with, ready for this? The fact that they found S-Corps with non-resident alien shareholders. Uh, 
which as we all know is a no, no. Right. And so the IRS agreed to look into the 151 S corps that they identified and also to a review eligibility status and analyze that same group for next year. But everything about changing how they uh, conduct examinations um, and, and to bring up this reasonable compensation issue or to use data from other workflows to aid their decision making in going after these reasonable compens compensation problems, the IRS uh, uh, declined, did not agree with those recommendations. So the only thing that I can think of is that it's a resource issue, that the IRS feels they don't have the, the staff uh, to, to deal with this. Now, I don't have an examination background, but, but you do. So um, how do you think the, and again, you mentioned earlier, you know, two, three years down the road, this might be a longer term thing, but we kind of need to be thinking about it now as practitioners. Right. What, what, I guess two questions. One, Dan, what do you think the IRS will, will ultimately do with this because they're, they are leaving money on the table and they know that. And then two, what can we as practitioners be doing with our clients to, you know, just cut this off at the pass and yeah, we're probably going to be doing the IRS's work for them, but you know, we, we, we should be helping our clients be in compliance anyway, so they don't get caught up in this when it does become an enforcement initiative. So those are the, the two things, if, if you could address those. Yeah. Well, the, the first thing is let, let's take a look at what the IRS is, is doing. Okay. And the, the current commissioner, uh, Chuck Reddig, um, who is, a, you know, a, an attorney who's doing what we've done in IRS collections representation, exam representation in LA before he came into the job now, what, two plus years ago, um, probably almost three years ago. Um, and he, when he came in, you know, there were a lot of things that he wanted to do and get in place. And, and they came out with this six year plan to uh, improve the technology of the IRS, which is hopefully some of this new money that the IRS is going to get. Now, I was also on a webinar um, not that long ago, probably two months ago, that um, with the IRS commissioner basically said there's 82,000 employees in the IRS, and I think it was 52,000 of them will yeah. be retiring in the next six years. Yeah. Um, so that, that's the challenge that they're facing because not, not only are they having to replace that many people, um, they're, they're actually going to probably have to hire more. So they're going to have to staff up and what Congress is going to give them and hopefully some new money, both for people and, te and you know, technology equipment stuff. Um, uh, but, you know, th they're also in a tight market on top of that. Um, and so anything that I've been around to that the IRS is doing, they're literally saying, hey, if you want a, a job at the IRS, please contact us. And, and right. that's not something you normally saw. But having said that, if they put the proper technology in place um, using AI, ro robotic, uh, robotic process automation, the RPA, um, you know, using, uh, you know, simple techniques. I mean, this is uh, a document matching, you know, notice that you can do from an escort perspective. Um, and when, you know, you go, go back to on the collection side that we always talk about, that 941 payroll taxes is what funds the daily operations of the government. This seems like a no-brainer that they should be going after this. I mean, it's it's low-hanging fruit. It's easy money that they could go and easily, you know, say. Because um, uh, I, I had a client that, um, and, and this is the other way that, that, you know, the IRS can find out about you. Um, not just from the easy, hey, I can see there's no officer's compensation, you had $100,000 of profits and $80,000 of distributions. Um, but we, you know, here in Florida, we don't have an income tax, right? but we do have state unemployment tax. Now, that state um, unemployment tax can generally range from, you know, as low as like $7 a person, because it's, it's a, a, a tenth of a percent on the first $7,000 to as much as I think it could be as high as of about almost $400 a, a person. So it's not a huge tax that we're talking about. So if you have a lot of employees, then it's a bigger tax. But the, the sole guy, I mean, it could be as low as seven bucks. Right. Um, and I had one client that got an unemployment audit. And when we did this, 
the state actually went through and did a reasonable comp calculation on my my guy. And I told him that, you know, he'd do some health issues and other things. He only was doing about 25%. And so they came out with what they deemed reasonable compensation. And he was close. And so that, you know, and and there was no additional tax to pay because he had he had met the cap. Okay. But you know where that data goes? That data goes to the IRS. The IRS is helping to fund those operations. Right. And the state is willingly taking it and sharing that information. So um, and trust me, they're doing it with with your state too. Correct. Um, whatever state you're in, they're they're you know that state is doing those types of in you know uh, those audits. So they can find that that information, um, and we need to try and do you know we've we've got the 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 hard task of having to protect our clients you know from their idiotic moves, um, even if that sometimes is ignorance of the law. Um, you know, we've got to, got to tell them ignorance of the law only works to a certain point. Once you know that you're doing something wrong, it's not ignorance of the law, even if you choose not to do it. Um, so, you know, and, and if you're a good practitioner like myself, where you try to document and, and show things and and say that you explain certain things to, to people, you know, by sending them an email, sending a letter, certified mail, whatever it takes to document that you've communicated that to them. So that they, when they later get dinged and they try to throw you under the bus, um, you know, that's, that's what you got to do to protect yourself. But, you know, on the same standpoint, it comes back to what I said earlier, you've got to put your foot down and say, you know, to be my client, you need to start doing this and you need to start doing it going forward. Now, this goes back to a lot of the exercises and things that we do in our boot camps. When we, when we do our exercise with Randy, the realtor, one of the things we recommend to help try to fix Randy and help him to get out of, of him being, you know, pyramiding his debt and having it happen every year is, you know, as a realtor, you know, if he can, you know, because there are some states that have some quirky laws and things about, you know, having this, but have him create an LLC, have him be an S corporation, have him, you know, do that and pay reasonable compensation. Even if sometimes what we say is reasonable compensation to start with might be hundred percent of his, of his income just so that we can get Randy so that he's because the kick in the pants happens at the the end of the year because they didn't make estimated payments. Now they owe self-employment tax plus income tax. And then, and then you, you know, you you get this big kick in the pants with this, uh, you know, $50,000 bill when he could have been paying that a little bit each month through payroll taxes, had some big, nice withholding. So it's the eating the elephant theory that I say, you know, how do you eat an elephant? You bite, you eat it at one bite at a time. So if you make it into smaller bites and pieces for Randy to pay his payroll, then now he's got a $60,000 salary at $5,000 a month. You, you know, you have him pay $1,000, $1,500, $2,000 in federal withholding um, so that now he's covered for his wage as well as any extra, you know, pass through income. Then, you know, then you're doing them a service to, to help that. Um, I had this in uh, an email conversation with a client uh, just today about that, you know, that, that, you know, he likes that, and he, but he's got to have some minimum amount that's coming up in his personal bank account to pay his personal bills. And then, and then, you know, then the flip side is, um, you know, how do you, uh, you know, try to make sure that you document that and communicate to them that, that now they can take distributions, but I always tell people don't do the distributions in any regular form or fashion, same amount, same frequency, you know, that type of thing. Cause otherwise what's it look like, you know, another payroll. So right. we want to avoid that. Um, so, you know, if you can do that and, you know, and I would say for many businesses that reasonable compensation is probably between 40 and 60, depending on the market, the state, you know, obviously out West, it might be a little bit more than, than something, you know, out East. Um, but, and, and it depends on what they do. I mean, you know, software, software engineers, you know, could be a higher a rate or, um, in fact, there was on our, on our group call today, the tax resolution office hours call, somebody said, we were talking about employment and, you know, finding, uh, people. And they said, uh, one tax manager, somebody had a friend that was a tax manager in South Carolina was offered $250,000 to get a job in South Carolina. Wow. Um, so, um, you know, so, th- you know, there are things out there like that, but, but the biggest thing is we've got to help our clients understand what the rules and responsibilities. Um, the other thing that, that the TIGDA report um, talked about was, um, I think it said, what was it, 3.3 billion is not going into Social Security and Medicare. Um, so, you know, that, that alone, I always tell people that, you know, 
when you get your S election, the S election letter says you must pay regional comp- compensation. I right. mean, it's right there in black and white. Um, so you, you almost you can't say that you haven't seen it. And obviously, getting it and reading it are two totally different things. True. But <laughs> it's usually so, part of the problem. <laughs> yes. Um, but you know that's why it, you know at least from the standpoint of of you know, we talk about computers replacing our jobs and doing things. And I could totally see that more, a lot more so in individual world. And it can, you know, and it will happen in the, in the business world too, but you still Slower. can't replace, you can't replace the, the knowledge that we have as, as professionals and they still don't know everything that they need to do. Um, and so they're still going to be higher wealth people, you know, the S corp uh, partnership, C corp owners, you know, are going to still want to seek us out. Um, Uh, But, you know, so to answer your question is the IRS is making changes um, and and there there are going to be changes that can be easily done and taken care of. Um, In fact, I don't I think you've probably seen that that the IRS is making an effort to try and go paperless. Yes. Um, And so there are things that are going to start happening like that. And and if they don't have to start paying that that uh, the Postal Service for 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 all the the mail that they're sending um, and how much money they can save on on that, um, you know, there are a lot of things they can do with that extra money Um, and sending a notice through an e-portal. Uh, will be one of those things that will be a, a whole lot. I mean, th- so there are things that are changing like that that Correct. are going to make it easier. And I think the, the thing as a practitioner, um, we got to put our foot down. We've got to tell clients the, the rules of the road to work with us. And then we've got to make them and encourage them to do that. Whether we get them with a payroll company or you do the payroll yourself. I've got, m- m- I do payroll, but I only do pretty much the officer onesie twosie type thing. Sure. So you're going to work with me we're going to set you up in a payroll. We're going to get you going. We're going to get you some reasonable compensation. And in fact, something's better than nothing. So, you know, and I had that happen with a client where uh, a TCO was doing a desk audit on, on a return on the individual, didn't do the business. I, apparently they looked at the business and said, um, hey, I happen to see he's not doing reasonable compensation. That's something going to need to start doing. So, you know, when you've gotten that verbal warning, and I don't know what kind of notes she makes in the file, but if that's in the file somewhere um, that that's been communicated, you need, was to, noted. You, you need to fix things like that. Um, because, you know, that's kind of that almost kind of goes back to some of the rules when we talk about the trust fund recovery penalty about being willful and responsible. Um, responsibility is hard to get out of, but willful is an easier thing to, to try and do. But once you know, now you're willful if you don't make the change, and and that's what you gotta try to try to avoid. I mean, this you you mentioned this, but I mean the the, the standard thing I always did with collections cases um, was to put the person on 100% payroll, meaning that for the period during which I was representing them and we were working towards a resolution. So usually a period of roughly about six months, um, you put. Um, everything that they're taking out of the business is run through payroll. Um, And even though every tax professional listening to this is going to say, that's not the proper tax planning move. It's not. I acknowledge that. Um, But what it does do is it demonstrates to the IRS that you are taking measures to... uh, put a process in place to make sure that those taxes are getting paid because this person has a history of not making their estimateds uh, on the pass-through portion. So we solve that. We solve that behavioral finance problem by just running it all through payroll. Right. Um, and then it, it gets the person used to living on uh, uh, within their means um, and it gets them used to living in a world where they actually pay their taxes. Right. Um, and so, yeah, it's not the ideal tax planning move, but to fix some of these taxpayer behavioral changes, that's sometimes what we need to do. Um, real quick, I don't want to make this too long, but real quick, I know that inevitably somebody is going to ask the question, okay, fine, how do we determine reasonable compensation that we should be using for our clients? And Um, I'll just say one of my favorite things out there um, are these salary survey 
websites uh, that th there's there's several of them where you can look up you know average salary by job title position seniority and location um, in order to get um, a, a kind of a geographical um, you know because because the same position is going to pay different in New York City than it does in Casper Wyoming um, and and so there are plenty of websites out there there's some software tools as well um, what uh, what do you use when doing this um yeah what did what's i forget the site that um the you know the infobiz um not infobiz the what's the name of that site jason that um we normally recommend for in uh you know industry information oh the uh oh you know what? I can't remember it off the top of my head. I'll look yeah, it up. But, it you know, up. basically, the, there's stuff that you can go to look at for industry information. There's yeah. specific, they're, they're benchmarking you know, reports. Yeah, benchmarking reports. You know, things that um, you know, and for us in our industry, and you know, who is it? Robert Half does their, you know, uh, their uh, uh, compensation surveys of you. You know, you live in the southeast, and you're in a manager. You, you know, you were in a public accounting firm. You work in private firms. You know, you work in um, industries. Uh, that these are compensation levels, you know, there's, there's many ways that you can do it. There's other services out there. There's, you know, there's Ibis in, world, Ibis world. That's it. Um, uh, <laughs> IBIS yeah, world. Yeah. And there's, there's another one that we, I forget what it was that there's hey, RC that, reports. No, that that's the, the, the RC reports is a, is a service that you can pay for and use. Yes. Um, and they they have good questionnaires and good things that will help you actually calculate and determine that. It's a good service. Um, and, you know, and they give emails where they occasionally give, you know, these oddball, um, you know, like, a um, you know, a hot dog cart, you know, payroll for, you know, they give you like five locations around the country on what they're paid a, a watch, a watch repair man or something like that. I seen one, uh, you know, time. But, you know, and obviously it's different for everybody. Uh, but, you know, I, again, something is better than nothing. I would say at a minimum, if you can get them somewhere 40 to 60 to at least start with, and then you can tweak it later or, you know, going where what you said, Jason, you know, if, if they were doing hundred thousand dollars and we put them on a hundred thousand dollar paycheck roughly, um, and then just get that to start with, and then maybe you can dial it back once you've determined what the reasonable compensation is, because you, you've got, you've got a legitimate reason as to why, um, you know, you're, you're getting somebody to do uh, that particular reason, you know, it's, you are fixing their collection, you know, problem so that they're not doing it every year. And now we're trying to get them on the straight and narrow uh, that, that here's the reasonable comp. And, and obviously the more data you have to support it, the better off you're going to be. Uh, because trust me that the, the IRS, you know, has those tools at their resources, just like they, you know, on the collection side, we talk about, you know, using, um, uh, you know, the uh, Kelly Blue Book or using, you know, real estate tools, good real estate tools, not the Zillow or Realtor.com. They actually have good real estate estimating tools for values of real estate. They're, you know, they're going to do the same thing from a compensation perspective. But this is the thing that to me, I would easily say somewhere between the next five and 10 years, this is something that I could see become a, a, a very, you know, coordinated issue uh, that they do because somebody's going to realize that it's the low hanging fruit. It's going to be easy, something to say, Hey, I can, I, I can find something on a tax return that probably relates to, to this one thing. You know, when you figure half of S corps that, you know, that, that, you know, if you figure statistically half of the S corps they're auditing, should have this problem. Right. And, and this TIGTO report clearly um, indicates that they, they already know who these folks are because they can pull the data and, and all the records with the name and address on it in order to do the TIGTO audit. You know, right. so in order to pull their sample set, they're pulling the data. And so um, I think your five to 10 year estimate is... Um, extremely optimistic. I would expect within the next two years um, that uh, this will, will happen because it is low-hanging fruit, even with the technology they already have in place. 
Well, no, I, I see. I think it's just, again, more of a resources thing. And, and we'll see what happens with, sure. with Congress, giving them more money. If they can get more money yeah. um, from this it, is a no-brainer. I, to- I totally see that timeline that I just gave a lot better. And the other thing that I found that was interesting in this data set, Jason, is that the data that we're using and what TIGDA used, it says was from a 2013 data. Yeah. So could you imagine how much more, how different it is with today's data, if they were using 2021 yes. data, um, I'd say it's probably even more so, um, you know, because I mean, I had a client that got a kick in the pants because of the uh, the whole coronavirus thing and the PPP because he wasn't taking a paycheck. Right. Um, and there were some people that were somehow still doing it without that. I don't know how, but, you know, they were they were doing that. Um, but he didn't get his P- PPP money because right. he wasn't taking a paycheck. I was yep. like, there's no reports to give you. There's nothing to do. You're not taking a paycheck. So yeah, well, say was, that changed shortly after. Paycheck protection program. If there's no know, paycheck, right. yes. then, I mean, yeah. <laughs> So, I mean, there are sometimes things like that, that happen. I mean, obviously I hope that's a once in a lifetime thing, Right. but you know, you, you never know. I mean, you know, the, the things, the way they're tied to, you know, compensation and things like that. And, and like I said, it's just easier for them you know, if we can have the little bites and pieces instead of getting the kick in the pants, you know, at, you know, come April 15th that, hey, you owe $50,000 when you could have paid it a little bit at a time and made it, you know, a better pill that they could swallow. So. Absolutely. All right. Well, let's go ahead and wrap up this episode of the show. Um, I'll drop some links down in the show notes. Thank you, everybody, for listening. And I hope that this was helpful for you, give you a little bit of perspective. Uh, and if you weren't aware of the realities uh, surrounding the lack of reasonable comp out there in the world, there you go. And this will likely come to a head sometime in the near future with a compliance initiative. So be sure to subscribe to the show and share it with all your tax pro friends. We would appreciate that. Thank you, Dan, for being here. And we'll see you next time. Thanks, Thanks, Jay. We'll see you next time. Do, 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 do. The Profitable Accountant Podcast.